Star Trek books. They've been around for decades. Join us, the Trek ladies, Kavora and Jen, as we discuss the novels one at a time. Welcome to the Ladies Trek Library. And we are here with Ladies Trek Library. I'm Kavora and I'm here with Jen. Hi, Jen. Hey, Kavora. Hey, everyone. I'm really happy to be back and talk about this book. So this time we are reviewing Enterprise. Let's see, it's actually called Enterprise the First Adventure by Vonda McIntyre. And this book was published in 1986. And just reading the back cover, he was the youngest man to captain a starship in Federation history. His crew included an untried first officer and a maverick ship surgeon. In the years to come, the voyages of Captain James T. Kirk and the USS Enterprise would become legend. But before their historic five-year mission began, before the crew meshed into the superb unit that would journey across the galaxy, before the legend took shape, there was the mission that brought them together for the first time. Here at last is that untold story, the first voyage of Captain Kirk, Mr. Spock, Dr. McCoy, and all the rest of the Enterprise crew, the most eagerly awaited Star Trek adventure of all. Okay, that's good. Yeah, so that just says it's the first adventure without really saying anything about the story. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and also to provide some context for our listeners, so 1986 was the year that Star Trek IV was released. So we know that when this book was written, the first three movies had been out. So let's talk about the characters. Um, what did you think about how, I mean, we know this, so that it takes place before we saw the characters on the original series. So you, you do expect them to be different. So what, what did you think about the portrayal of the regular characters in this book, Jen? I thought they were really good. Now, I, I don't, I think this may be the first Vonda McIntyre book that I've read. I, I'd have to like check my list, but I mean, it's possible I read one a while back and I can't remember. Um, but if I have read one, I haven't read a lot of her works like some of the other authors. So I didn't really know what to expect. I knew she had, um, you know, written quite a few and, um, had heard she was a good author. Um, but I really didn't, wasn't familiar with her style or her portrayal of the characters. Um, I thought it, I really enjoyed I, the, uh, characterizations. I thought, um, you know, I could see how all of them developed into the characters that we know starting with the show and later on, um, you know, and they were all just sort of a younger version of themselves. Um, you know, it's especially kind of neat to see a, a very young uh, Sulu who uh, didn't want to be on the enterprise at all. Um, wanted to be out fighting on the frontier um, because he was kind of a hotshot pilot. Um, but all the characters were, I mean, you know, there wasn't a lot of differences between what we see uh, them in this book and, and on the show, with the one exception of Janice Rand. Um, and really, I mean, this is the first Star Trek book that I've read that really goes into any kind of depth about her character. I mean, she's been in a few that I've read, but usually just mentioned as, you know, being on the bridge and and that's about it. Um, so it was really interesting uh, to see the author's idea of what Janice Rand was like um, as a very young. In this book, she's really a teenager uh, starting out. Um, what did you think about uh, the portrayal of Rand? It, it was interesting. And you're right. I think this is the first like time we that we're giving her backstory. Um, so, it, yeah, and, and she had a terrible history. I mean, her, you know, she grew up in – slavery and and like on, on a planet where she was just t terribly mistreated and um and decided to join starfleet and she basically like ran away to join starfleet she was so she was 16 underaged um some of that's hard to believe just because when when you see her on the show she doesn't look that much younger than than you know the rest of the crew like um sulu or or Kirk, I mean, she doesn't look, you know, tremendously younger than they are. So it's hard to believe that she was really underaged. Um, I mean, but other than that, it it was a neat story for her. And I like how um, 
Uhura was her mentor in this. And, and you, you can see that in Uhura, that she would be so nice and try to help her. And, and when she found out about her being underage, she still kept her secret and everything. You know, I like that about Uhura, too. Um, and the thing about Rand in, in this book, sort of having to prove herself and, and, and getting self-confidence. She was just so, um, so unsure of herself in this story at the beginning and the way she was so scared of Kirk, which you can understand with her backstory in this. So, so that was interesting. Um, learning about her past. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I, I thought it was interesting to give her a more fuller, you know, make her into a fuller character. Um, but it was hard for me to believe that she was just 16 because this novel takes place maybe like what a, a year or or not even that after the, the the beginning of the show and clearly you know by that time she she doesn't look 16 she looks like she's in her 20s uh so uh it was maybe a little hard to believe the whole story of a 16 year old managing to uh you know get into starfleet um but uh but i appreciated that the author uh you know gave us this background story on this character that we don't really see much uh, what did you think about the uh, characterizations of like McCoy and Sulu and and some of the other ones and and Gary Mitchell? We haven't talked about him. Oh yes, yeah. So I, I mean, I thought um, so so Sulu was good. I mean, you can understand like if he didn't want to be on the Enterprise at first. Well, it's kind of they had their they had an established crew like Uhura and Spock had already been there and Pike. Yeah, I mean, you know, Pike, this is when Pike just got promoted. But yes, Sulu was, was looking forward to going to another ship where he could be a pilot. And, and so, so he, you know, learned in this story, you know, he had his journey like, well, okay. I, so this ship isn't so bad after all. And McCoy, I, I like that they had McCoy being, um, sort of a daredevil at, at the beginning. They said, the book says that he had been, rafting and when he showed up on the enterprise he was all dirty his he was disheveled his clothes were messed up and and i think that was supposed to be an homage to the motion picture when he showed up on the enterprise at first and he had that beard and he was wearing <laughs> civilian clothes <laughs> and so so that was that was funny um i mean other than that i can see how his character evolved into the mccoy that we know he he was pretty much the same as far as just being the irascible kind arguing with Spock and everything. And I think that the Spock in this story was probably not as interesting. He he was very logical and that was just, you know, I, th I think it, it, you know, and it makes sense at this time, he probably didn't understand humans as much, even though he had already been working with humans, he had already been serving under Pike, but he still had less experience than we saw him later with Kirk. So so he he just seemed very more um much more vulcan like in in this book I think it's kind of the way I saw him. Yeah, I think uh I think she was really trying to show about how he, you know, in at this juncture he doesn't really know Kirk. So it's not the same as when we first watched the show and they've known each other and they're very close. Um and they have this rapport. Um so it was kind of like he was uh, you know uh, didn't really know what to make of, of Captain Kirk and and she also made a a kind of a big deal to emphasize throughout the book the differences between um Pike and Kirk and um even though Pike is human um he's a much more Vulcan like captain than Captain Kirk he's he's cool and collected and uh and so it was a maybe trying to show that, you know, Pike was, uh, or Spock was used to dealing with a captain like Pike. Um, and I think there's even a, a part where an internal monologue in Spock's head where he says something to himself, he's thinking, oh, you know, um, this James T. Kirk is kind of brash and, um, you know, a little uh, just, you know, he's thinking about how different he is from Captain Pike. And, but then he thinks, well, but you know, he's, He's he may be like that, but it seems like he still knows what he's doing. So he kind of eventually, you know, realizes at the end. And we also get to see like the beginnings of McCoy and Spock's 
sparring. Yes. <laughs> so you can see where that all, um, you know, started. And it's kind of funny. And I actually, it's a line at the end of the book, but it's not a spoiler or anything. But it's the first line where you see this and it makes you think, is this the first time that this was said? And is this where McCoy got the idea? Because there's a scene at the end of the book where um, Spock says to McCoy, um, I believe that what Miss Lucarian, who's one of the original characters, is trying to tell you, Spock said to McCoy with his usual bluntness, is that you are a doctor, not a magician. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was a great line. Yeah. <laughs> So then it makes me think, oh, is that where Dr. McCoy, did he get that idea from Spock? <laughs> um, but also we wanted to talk about Gary Mitchell because um, I didn't, he was in the book in a way that I didn't expect. Um, you know, since I knew this was pre, uh, you know, this was the first adventure, I knew that Gary Mitchell was going to be in the book. But um, he's really not part of the action because he is recovering. Um, he was injured. Um on Kirk's previous ship. Um, and, uh, you know, we see him at the beginning of the book where uh, he's still unconscious and Kirk is visiting him. Um, and then there's a, you know, scene later where um, Kirk, uh, where he's recovered and he, um, you know, makes a phone call to Kirk or I don't know what they call it, a Zoom call, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, to tell him that he's, he's conscious again, but he's still, uh, going to be out of action for a while. Um, but what I really liked was throughout the book, he's con Kirk is constantly thinking about Gary Mitchell, um, you know, as his best friend and the man that he wanted to be his first officer. Um, but that's not how it worked out. Um, and so um, even though he's not physically present, um, Kirk thinks about him throughout the, the book, um, which I like because, you know, from what we had of him in the original series, you know, they were supposed to be such great friends. Um, so I, I like that that was included. Yeah, definitely. Um, in, in this book, you can, you can tell the, the camaraderie between Kirk and Gary, just the way, the way they talk. It, it's pretty obvious. They're best friends and they're, um, and they have this history together. And yeah, so it, it was an issue to Kirk that because he, he knew when he got his first command that he would want Gary Mitchell to be his first officer. But Kirk was told by Admiral Noguchi that that uh, that Spock was going to be his first officer. And that could be another reason why Kirk kind of didn't like Spock in the beginning. And but also because, you know, he, he expected it to be Gary. And the thing is, well, well, you know, we saw Picard like Picard got to pick his first officer. So I wonder if maybe maybe that isn't the way it was in Starfleet back then, and, and Kirk didn't get to pick his first officer, but I, but he was expecting to get to choose, and um, and I kind of think maybe you know maybe it's just because Gary had been hurt at this time, and they wanted um, the Enterprise to go ahead and go on a mission, so they had to have a first officer, and since Gary Mitchell wasn't available, they let Spock do it, and and Spock was. Probably, you know, they knew he would probably be good enough to to keep that position, and another position would probably open later for Gary. Oh, but of course, we know what happened on the original series. Gary did wind up back on the Enterprise, just not as first officer. But that is that is what happened. Um, but yeah, they they Kirk and Gary did have a good uh, dynamic. Uh, so, and of course, and we we do want to talk about Kirk in this. Um, so, so with Kirk and Spock, as you mentioned, like when, when they first met in, I mean, this book has the first uh, meeting between the two of them. And um, and they're both thinking that they really don't, you know, like the the kind of person the other is. Kirk's is he's thinking he doesn't like scientists, which I think is odd because Kirk's, you know, Kirk's brother is a scientist. But, um, but you know, that's what he's thinking, like, well, scientists broad, I know, are stodgy and give too much information and. And Spock is thinking, well, Kirk is the hero type, and heroes are kind of sloppy because they don't really like – you would only have a hero in a situation where the situation got out of hand in the first place. So they're both thinking that, and I can – so I can kind of see how it, – it, it's good that they started that way just because you because you see how they changed during the course of the book. I mean, yeah, so Vonda McIntyre would want to put that in, but also, I mean – it. 
It didn't have to be that way. I mean, they, they, you know, you could have written it where they liked each other from the beginning. But um, also, I think Kirk was kind of portrayed as this. Um, he, he's more arrogant in this. I mean, he's like, you know, of course, he's younger too. He's 29. His first command. Or his first starship command, because he was he. They said he was in command of a ship before this, but it was like a freighter or something. But he had been in command before. But this is his first ship command, and and he's disappointed with with the mission that that they give him. His mission is to take these vaudeville actors uh, around to um, what they call the phalanx, which I think is just a certain uh, a certain section of space. So. Kirk just seems really, you know, you know, he's a little more arrogant in this. I guess it's just sort of, and you're supposed to think, well, it's just due to his youth and inexperience. Um, what did you think about Kirk? Yeah, he was a bit more arrogant than the Kirk we see on the show. Um, but, yeah, I did think the it was just, you know, first command. But also uh, you, you can see where, um, you know, he... I wouldn't say he was arrogant. I just maybe a little, you know, maybe a bit of a more arrogant than than in the show. But uh, you know, I guess he's expecting his first command. You have certain expectations, and what does it turn out to be? But uh, oh, your first command is going to be you're basically just um, taxiing this vaudeville company from starbase to starbase. Um, not what what he was expecting. So it's easy to see why. He was disappointed, um, but he ended up, um, you know, and, and there's a scene in the beginning of that where he kind of um, he's kind of a jerk to Lindy, who is the head of the company. But he, he thinks about it and realizes that he's in the wrong um, and, and he apologizes and he learns from it. So you see where his character is going, that he's kind of learning from some of his experiences. Um, but the the part about the vaudeville company yeah, that's when I started, you know, it's a, the novel has a very slow at the beginning, but I actually liked it because we were getting to know the characters and, you know, how they first met. And, you know, we also see Chekhov briefly, although he's just, they mentioned that he's there, you know, working one of the odd shifts, but we're getting to know all these characters. So I didn't, didn't bother me that uh, it was a slow pace, but then when <laughs> they announced that the first mission was going to be taking a vaudeville company i was like really oh, the same <laughs> reaction as kirk yeah <laughs> so i can understand um but i guess you know like in the conscience of the king they took um you know they took a theater company around so i mean i guess she's basing it somewhat on the show um what did you think about uh the the whole concept of the the first mission being uh a vaudeville uh taxi um it does seem strange um I mean, I guess that they it, it's a good idea just because it's it's his first time. So why not give him something e easy, <laughs> even though, you know, he'll be disappointed. But but I mean, it's yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, Starfleet ships do that kind of thing. They do. They do have to um, take people to different places like like in Journey to Babel, taking ambassadors, even though that's considered more important. But, you know, you have to treat every mission like, you know, it's your job. You have to do it. Um the fact that they that there even is a Volville company like that that's something that exists in in Star Trek's time seems unusual like you know and when they're doing the show doesn't it seem like it just yeah it's so out of place even though I know they you can have things out of place they can say that that it is a, a call to the past but doing magic tricks and they and it's the kind of magic tricks that we're used to seeing now in our time and you would think in the 23rd century they would do something more advanced they could do more advanced tricks with more advanced technology um the only advanced technology they they did have that key that little key thing that becomes important later but that so that was really it everything else they they did was just what we have now um you know and there were there were dogs they had part you know, dogs are part of the vaudeville show, which we would, which we see now. And Shakespeare, I think that part was different. Having someone who, who sort of translates Shakespeare into regular English, which I thought that was kind of neat. But, but you know, I don't know how entertaining that would be to other people, putting that in a show. But anyway, um, 
Yeah, I, I mean, I thought similar because really, I mean, I don't, vaudeville doesn't really even, it didn't really even exist when this book was written. Right. So, yeah. um, I mean, I guess what she's saying, they're like a throwback. But yeah, you, it's not not at all what what you'd expect. Um, that, that this sort of variety show, which has like a mime, and uh, you know, the the, do- the guy who has the dancing dogs and the magician and the the Shakespeare, and I think there was dancers. Um, you know, not not something that you'd expect to see. So it was a little, yeah. <laughs> I yeah. Guess where Kirk was coming from, and a juggler. Lest we forget. A, yes. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to jump ahead, but we could talk about the juggler. <laughs> yeah, also a part of the show. Um, so so what do you think about Kirk and Lindy, you know, the um, the leader of this vaudeville group? Yeah, I mean, you know, it was kind of this stereotypical. Uh, this reminded me very much of the conscience of the king. Um you know, where he's sort of, you know, he finds himself attracted to Lindy, who's the uh, head of the vaudeville company. Um, nothing happens between them. Um, he's thinking about, you know, whether he should even express any feelings towards her when um, she basically comes out and tells him she has a, a, a crush on someone else and uh, asks for his advice. So, um, you know, it doesn't come to pass. It's just a flirtation. But we saw a lot of that on the original series so that that uh was you know nothing new but uh it does bring me back to uh carol marcus who we forgot to talk about um, yeah yeah because we see her at the beginning of the book um you know kirk meets her uh while he's recovering from um the same uh incident that injured gary uh, mitchell and that's where he meets carol marcus and they fall in love um, and break up. Um, but interestingly enough, in the book, she never tells him that she's pregnant. But we know from later on that he knew about David. So I thought it was a little weird that it's not mentioned. Like they just break up and he doesn't know. So uh, yeah, I think I mean, it, we're supposed to think he found out later, probably. Oh, OK. Yeah, but yeah, it, it is mentioned. It it is neat that Carol Marcus is in the book. Yeah, and there's even a scene where she's like talking to one of her friends, and although they don't say she's pregnant, you know, they the whole st- scene is implying that you know she found out she's pregnant, and so I'm expecting there to be a scene where she tells Kirk, and it doesn't happen. So I guess we have to assume that he he found out later. Um, but um, yeah, it, it was neat that they included a little backstory on their relationship and how they met and fell in love and how they, why they decided to stay apart. Because when you, um, you know, when you see the character David for the first time and you're, you're kind of like, what? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. We were surprised, (laughs) you know, and um, then you think, well, man, what a um, bad father Kirk is. Right. And he had this son and, um, but now you see that, you know, what, this, what happened is that she was very committed to her career, which was on, you know, this on, on a certain planet. And he was getting his first command. And, you know, they knew that in order to stay together, one of them would have to give up their, you know, what had been their dreams um, and that it wasn't going to work out. Um, so I, yeah. I like that they included that. And and um, with Kirk and Carol Marcus, their well, their relationship was explored in another novel, too. I forgot the name of it right now, but it's but and and it was almost it was almost like that where they Carol knew she was pregnant and she just decided not to tell Kirk because she knew he was an up and coming captain that he would be he would be a captain someday and she just couldn't take that away from him because if he knew he had a son he would probably drop that to help raise the son but anyway but that's you know that's all um, assumptions that pretty much fit the fit the bill. Um, so getting to the next thing. So, well, you know how, I mean, now that we have strange new worlds, um, we can talk about a little, a little bit about how the book relates to some things or how it's different from some things in strange new worlds and even discovery. Um, oh, and of course, and the fact that the book has another Vulcan named Steven, oh, and the book says that's not his real name, but it's his assumed name now. They call him Steven. They don't say what his other name is. He he turns out to be Spock's cousin, and he 
very much reminds me of Cyborg. And this book was written before Star Trek V. But I think it Stephen in this book is a lot like Cyborg with the um, uh, being sort of a Vulcan outcast or someone who isn't like the other Vulcans. He likes to explore emotions. And in this book, Spock practically hates him for all intents and purposes, even though Spock will say he can't hate anybody. But um, he pretty much hates him. And and um, so what did you think about that, the similarities with Stephen and Cybok? Well, um, I was definitely not expecting to see, um, you know, so we'll say that Steven is the juggler in the vaudeville company and he, yeah. he gets the job. He's just getting the job, um, as the, the story's, uh, taking place. So he's the new, the new juggling act. And when she says she gets a new juggler, you're not expecting it to be a Vulcan with long blonde hair who seeks out emotion. <laughs> it just sounds like straight out of fanfic. <laughs> um, and then, you know, and she made a point to talk about how he, he wore his hair in a ponytail, but he would take the ponytail out and shake it out. And, it, you know, it seemed like a very Fabio type of um, romance novel thing to do. So at first I was like, really? Uh, <laughs> um, but he was an interesting character. Um, you know, he, uh, I, I didn't, I didn't feel that he actually had a lot in common with Cybok. Now, I mean, they obviously have the similarity in that they're both pretty much outcasts, although Steven was not, um, you know, as far as we know, he's not banned from Vulcan or anything. He wasn't trying to convince other people to uh, explore their emotions like Cybok was, so he didn't get uh, yeah, banished or anything. Yeah, and um, he seems more, you know, and Cybok was kind of like a, a cult leader in some ways. Um, but, you know, Stephen isn't looking for followers. He's, um, and the more you get to know him it, and you see why Spock doesn't like him. And it's a very interesting story, which is that, you know, uh, uh, suppressing his emotions has something, is something that has always come very easily to Stephen to the point where he, sort of felt like he doesn't even have emotions and that he's empty. And that's what led him to want to explore his emotions. Um, and he seeks out, I almost felt like he was like um, someone like a drug user who, you know, the more you use drugs, you have to keep using more and more because you, you know, the amount that you're using no longer gets you the high and he's constantly chasing the high and he can maybe get it for a split second, this feeling of emotion. But he's so disciplined that, you know, it's just fleeting. And he, he has to, you know, make all this work to get this emotion again. So he was a little different from Cybok in that way. And the reason that Spock really didn't like him was because he was jealous. Um, I mean, he didn't, he wouldn't, he wouldn't come out and say that he was jealous because that's an emotion. But, um, you know, here's Stephen, you know, really has doesn't have to make any effort to control his emotions it comes naturally to him and spock is struggling and it's kind of ironic if that's the right use of the word ironic that uh you know it's steven is is jealous of spock because he um you know after he mind melds with him at one point um he realizes that spock has all this emotion and he wishes that he could feel the emotion that Spock feels. Um, so I thought he was an interesting character, even though it was a little odd to have this long haired Vulcan uh, juggler in the story. Yeah. 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 That was strange, but I did, I did like Steven though. I think he was really portrayed as, like you said, he was very interesting. Um, you know, the way, uh, the way he was portrayed in this book and, and saying that he's a blonde Vulcan sounded interesting. Um, and thinking of emotion as, as, like a type of drug i hadn't thought of that that was good um and so having yeah so spock had this so a, a past with cyborg and it, and so it, it was interesting to see the two of them the way they um interacted together but yeah very interesting that the book came out before star trek five and you know um it makes you wonder did did uh did the writers of star trek 5 had anyone heard of this book or this character hmm. yeah interesting yeah <laughs> and um 
and I just had to mention too, Michael Burnham from uh, from Discovery, since she, she is Spock's sister that we never knew about. You know, just like we didn't know that Spock had a brother, Cybok. But as far as Burnham, I um, I just think it's it's interesting the the fact that she was a human raised by by Sarek, and she was trying to suppress her emotions, which we saw in the in the flashbacks on Discovery. And it's it's very different from Stephen trying to trying to be emotional, even though he was raised as a full Vulcan. That is just, um, you know, some, something different there, a contrast there. Yeah. Um, it, it, one thing that, and I haven't, I haven't seen the latest uh, season of discovery and I haven't seen strange new worlds at all. Oh, okay. Um, I've been waiting for them all to finish. And then when I have the, the time, I'm going to just do Paramount Plus for like one month and binge them all at once. So I only have to do one pay for That's one That's cool. Month. <laughs> yeah, I know. I understand. <laughs> um, but, you know, from what the other, the first three seasons of Discovery, and, and I don't even know that the later seasons had a lot of flashbacks with Michael Burnham anyway. And no, I'm just, yeah, just the, on the ones you've seen. That's, that's all. I mean, what did you think? Yeah. Any well, similarities? Well, you know, I always, one thing that always bothered me is, you know, in the show and in the novel verse, but on in canon on screen, you know, they've always said that Vulcans have these very powerful emotions and it's, it's very hard for them to um, suppress their feelings. Um, and, you know, they've made a point of saying that their emotions are more powerful than human emotions. But then yet when Spock is having these emotional you know, difficulties controlling his emotions, he blames his human side, which doesn't really make any sense, because if we're saying that Vulcans have the more powerful emotions, the only reason that they're, you know, is that they're not acting upon them because they're trying to control them. So you would think that uh, a human whose emotions are supposedly not as powerful as a Vulcan's, if they were trained from, you know, birth, that it would be much easier for them to control their emotions than a Vulcan. Um, now, of course, Michael Burnham did not, she wasn't trained from birth. I mean, she was, what, like 11, maybe? Right, um, yeah. So that's a bit different. Um, so she might have been, but she did overall, you know, uh, you know, they show in the flashback, she, even in the beginning of Discovery, she's pretty Vulcan-like for a human. Yeah, that's what I was talking about, that right there where she was just... Yes, yeah, so emotionless there. But uh, but you're right, that's a good observation because they, you know, saying that Vulcans actually do have emotions but they control them. And I think that's really something that was added later. Um I think on on the original series with Spock, it, it they yeah, they did say that his emotions came from his human half. And and it could actually be it could be both. I mean, that, because humans are emotional and Vulcans are emotional too. So Without the Vulcan part to help him control his emotions, I guess that made his emotions even uh, harder to suppress. But, um, yeah, that is a good observation. Yeah, so I always wanted to see, like, would there be, uh, you know, would they ever have one where they showed a, a human who was raised, you know, in Vulcan in that environment from birth? How would that be? Because Spock always blames, you know, when the humans are emotional, it's because you're human, you like, you can't help it. But then we get into the like the nature versus nurture debate. And if if the logic is all just learned, then, you know, a human who was raised in that uh, should be able to learn it as well as a Vulcan. Yes, exactly. Um, so but but on Strange New Worlds, um, and I'm not giving this away, really, but but just the fact that it's got well, you know, they have Uhura as a character on it. So it's saying Uhura and Spock both served under Pike. And in, in this book, so it was – oh, it was Scotty as well. I mean, but it, but it's interesting. The book also had – has Uhura serving under Pike because that was never stated on the original series. So I just thought that was interesting that the book has that and Strange New Worlds has that with Uhura. Um, so going on to our next thing, what what did you think about the, the aliens when they, they found the new alien race in this book? I don't think they actually said their names, did they? But it was the aliens on the world ship. Yeah, they were, um, I mean, they were, the description to me was a little hard to visualize what they look like. I mean, we knew they could fly. They were yeah. furry and they had bright colors. Um, you know, they... The, uh, the Enterprise crew could not tell the difference between, you know, if there were men or women. So they, I guess they had an androgynous look, um, you know, and they do that a lot. I think in the novels where you see 
aliens that are a lot more uh, weird looking because you can do that in a novel, whereas on screen, you know, you got to have some human and just put some kind of makeup on them. Yeah. So, um, you know, you, I mean, you could have made somebody up to look like a furry uh, flying creature, I guess. But um, they were definitely, they, they seemed, uh, I don't know, kind of like flying apes in a way. Um, but of course, you know, they're a much more advanced uh, race. Uh, and although I, it was a little weird too, because they, although they were much more advanced, maybe it's because they were so much more advanced that they almost seemed like they just couldn't understand a, a lot of, you know, the humans and the, and Vulcans and stuff. Um, you know, but then they had these scenes where they would fly around and hunt, which to me seemed very primitive. So at the one hand, they're kind of like primitive flying apes, but they're more advanced. So it was a little weird. Yeah, um, they they had their own ship, which was called a world ship. I mean, and it was supposed to be huge, and but the so it, the ship was almost as big as a planet, as what they were trying to say, because they could, like, it had a sky and the ground or something, or to give you the idea that it did, and so they could fly in it and and hunt. I mean, yeah, you would think they would have you know replicators like the Enterprise has, but I guess not. Um, and I like that they that they sang to each other and and it made it like later in the book you see Uhura and Spock are sort of humming the some kind of song that they sing. I thought that was interesting too because we know how Uhura and Spock are both musical people. And um the the fact that the aliens couldn't well well like they didn't talk at first. They didn't talk until Spock mind melded with one of them and then and then that person was able to learn to speak um, Federation standard English, as we would say. Um, I, I like that, you know, those aspects of the book that made the story interesting and gave it more of the science fiction feel because as you mentioned, like it was like what the full, like half of the book at the beginning was, was just about introducing the characters, which was nice. And we know that that, that was the purpose of the book. That we wanted to see how all the characters were back then. So now we're getting into the part where, Oh, they actually do make first contact with these other people. And, and try to learn to communicate with them and and see the cultural differences. So, you know, and yeah, so that was all cool. That was interesting. And so uh, what do you think about that? Like the use of the Klingons, which I know they had a lot of the Klingons in, in the stories in the books back then. And this one had a Klingon woman that was a renegade and took over this other Klingon ship. It's different having, I think, like having a Klingon who wasn't um, who wasn't authorized to do what she was doing. She was just a complete uh, renegade and commanding her own ship and running running everything according to her rules. What did you think? Yeah, you know, she kind of reminded me of the Dora sisters. Um, she just uh, she was, you know, just a renegade and she had stolen this uh, ship from another Klingon. Um, and it was actually like a prototype type of a special ship. Um, and she, you know, was out there doing what she wanted. And she uh, she actually didn't really uh, she was kind of trying to give the finger to the Klingon Empire because uh, they mentioned that she is a, a member of a, um, I guess, a minority group. Uh, although they describe her as Klingon, I don't know if it was just a cultural minority, but uh, her she comes from a people uh, Klingon people who are a minority and they normally, they explain the women normally cover their faces, um, but she did not. Um, and that her, you know, they give you the impression that her uh, group of people were um, not treated so well by the most of the Klingons. And so she kind of had a reason to, to hate uh, the, the authorities, the Klingon authorities. And there was um, another the, the Klingon, um, what would you call it? The um, the organization that, that was mentioned in this book that was searching for her. The, um, well, the, whatever yeah, that. Yeah, the called. director and the. Uh, yeah. <laughs> trying to remember, but yeah, they were. Uh, it was led by the director, and uh, it, because it turns out that the uh, she had won the ship in a bed, and then she ended up, uh, I think, killing the captain anyway. 
but the uh, the captain whose ship she took over was the son of a, a high ranking uh, government official, and it was like a going to be a scandal. Yeah, so that that was all interesting too. Get a little bit of the the Klingon politics in it, yeah. and um, but the the woman Coronan, the Klingon woman, she yeah she was an interesting character, and um, so so and also getting to our next subject was about. Like they they had the the pits in this story. Uh, there was a a flying horse, and the horse was actually well. I think they also said he had a horn too. It was like a unicorn, and it had wings. And he or she she was named Athene, and they said that she was actually a part of um, gene manipulation, eugenics. And she had wings, but her wings weren't really big enough, so she, she usually she usually couldn't fly. She so she had these wings that she could flap, and she wanted to fly so badly, but she just couldn't. And and she was she was um, Lindy's pet, and it looked like so, so. Athene, the horse, was not really part of you know not part of the vaudeville show, but she was just Athene's pet or Lindy's pet, someone that she just took with her, and and Lindy carried cared about her very deeply uh, what did you think of Athene um you know this is one of the reasons why I did not like I, I couldn't recommend the book overall although there had been um you know a lot of it in the beginning that I liked I felt like there was so much time in this book devoted to talking about this flying horse <laughs> Uh (laughs) and i mean they talk about how she's um you know not uh, she's getting nervous by stuff happening and then she doesn't like being on the deck and so they have to like shoot some asteroids to get dirt and make dirt for her to grow grass so she's so there's like all this dirt and grass on the enterprise in the in the uh, deck where she's staying and it actually reminded me um of that there was like a next generation episode which I think I've blocked the episode name from my mind where it was like a terrible, um, I think it might be up the long ladder might be it. Yeah. Where... Yeah. Well, they had the, the hay in the, in yeah. the cargo bay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I was like, I was really tired of hearing about this horse and it, she just, I felt like they talked about it for so long in the book and I was like, it doesn't really fit in the story and it just was getting on my nerves. <laughs> so. <laughs> Well, that's kind of why, yeah, that's why I wanted to mention it, just because it, it was so, such a big part of the book. And, and you're like, you know, maybe um, the author, uh, you know, maybe she just really likes um, pets or horses. Um, and, and the there are words in the book like canter, which I think is like a horse's walk or something. I mean, I didn't know the word. I had to look it up. But but I noticed that there are other you know words in the in the book that have to do with horses that people who are horse horse owners would know. So it must have been, you, you know, it's something that that Vonda McIntyre threw in. So maybe she is a horse person, like William Shatner is a horse person. Um, yeah, there. Um, I knew what a canter was, but yes, there was this one scene where she's talking about. She thinks the horse is injured and she's touching all these different parts of her body. I had to look up these words in the dictionary. I didn't even know. I'd never heard. These are different parts uh-huh. of the body of a horse. I had never heard of them before. <laughs> so, yeah. So either the author loves horses and knows a lot about them or like she did a lot of research for this book. <laughs> yeah. And, and um. oh, and other pets. Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. Coronan, who is our Klingon renegade, has a pet, uh, a pink monkey. Named Starfleet, who she dresses up in a Starfleet uniform. Right, and she calls it Starfleet just she, as an insult to to Starfleet. Right. Yeah. That was just something. It was something cute, but it's kind of, but it's still, it's also repulsive when when you're reading it. I, you know, she she kept it on a leash, but it was it was a monkey type, so it's kind of. So you you think of it more like I don't know I guess like like Planet of the Apes when the apes had humans as pets you kind of that's to me I associated it with that like uh you know maybe it shouldn't be her pet but it but it was kind of, but it wasn't you know as as intelligent as she was but it it was just that that was really weird and that kind of got uncomfortable reading about how she treated him but 
Yeah, she mistreated her pet. I mean, she didn't, you know, beat him, but it was it was disturbing. You know, she kind of obviously was not a, a good owner. And you're reading about her, you know, withholding food and making the monkey do this and that and, you know, yelling at him. And it was weird. Um, you know, unfortunately, at the end of the book, um, he finds a happier home with uh, one of the Enterprise uh or a friend, not not the Enterprise crew, but I guess a friend of one of the, the Enterprise crew. Yes. Then also there we have on the Enterprise crew some um, cat feline um, crew members. Um, and then one of them had a friend who took a liking to this monkey and, uh, you know, gave him a good home. So, yeah, <laughs> at least they so had that a was happy good. ending. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But yeah, that was a little weird too. Like it kind of just added to the circus feel of the whole book with the vaudeville company anyway. Because we also had like the, the dancing poodles in the show. So. Yes. <laughs> so what are what are your thoughts? Any uh, any other thing to say in closing? Um, well, like I said, I, you know, I I couldn't recommend it only because I, I you know, it, it's not a it's not poorly written. The characters are well done. Um, I enjoyed, you know, the, the first half of it where they're talking about the crew getting to know each other. But once the vaudeville crew arrived and there's there's also a lot of drama with the vaudeville crew between the different crew members not getting along. And there's like one of them who's kind of crazy and does, um, you know, doesn't really like Lindy and he kind of also gets involved with Sulu and you know that's all weird and then um going to the world planet and it just it, it took a long time and like I said the horse thing just went on forever and I just kept like thinking when is this going to end like cuz I don't want to keep reading yeah <laughs> so you know that kind of ruined it and you know I guess maybe the author was like trying to poke fun at some some of the weirder episodes and fan fiction, but like all of it together was like, I almost felt like somebody got high and thought of this story <laughs> because like, how else could you bring? And then, you know, one thing we didn't mention is that the, the ending, which is, um, you know, so the Klingons are this thing called the phalanx, which is an area of space they're going through. It's, it's disputed territory between the Klingons and the Federation. And, um, so it's kind of dangerous area to be in because if you go on the wrong side, you know, you might get shot. So um, the Klingons show up, the whole Klingon, like the, you know, large section of their army show up to, to catch Coronan. Um, and also because the Enterprise is, you know, in what they view as their territory. And um, so this whole, you know, there's tension or the Klingons going to attack and, and all this and that. And in the end, um, you know, Kirk ends up preventing Coronan. She, in a last act, act of like vengeance, she's going to try to um, basically blow up the all the whole Klingon fleet, and he stops her. And so um, they sort of uh, they view Kirk as a hero, and they want to give him an award. <laughs> um, so they, you know, there's a scene where they uh, they have like a award ceremony, <laughs> and um, and then they have a vaudeville show on the world ship and the Klingons come to it. And this is kind of like funny and bizarre, um, you know, and the Klingons don't really like or understand the show. And so they're not clapping and it's kind of like, you know, the performers think they're bombing until the end when the guy who's doing the Shakespeare interpretation, who everybody thinks, you know, all the humans and everybody else thinks is terrible and the Klingons love him. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and they invite him to come to the, you know, Klingon Empire and perform, and it's just so bizarre. Like the whole, like I just, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it uh, was funny. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't like I said I don't know that I could you know if you know if you're determined to read all the Star Trek books, um, you know, it, it's not it's definitely not terribly written. It's just like wow, who thought this crazy idea up and, you know, what, what drugs were they taking? Um, <laughs> more how I kind of view it. So, Well, I kind of 
I liked it a little more than you. I mean, but I, I thought it was, you know, it was a very entertaining story, and um, and yeah, it was kind of crazy and far fetched. But I thought, I thought it wasn't, I don't, it wasn't that much out of line, I guess, or or maybe it was. But you have to think, well, because I mean, reading it now, it, like because it's an old book, and you just have to think, well, can kind of give them some slack. They didn't, you know, this Arthur didn't know as much about. Well, you know, because it was before T and G and everything that came after that. But, um, you know, and when I first read it, I thought I thought it was a good book. It, I mean, at least it's a good story and it's entertaining, you know, and that's and I still feel that way about it. Um, and, and yeah, I did want to mention, like, so you, you said about how the Klingons reacted to seeing the magic show and also how Spock reacted uh, the first time seeing the magic show. He basically heckled lindy she was the one doing the magic and he was like well it it went under it went up her sleeve you know she didn't really make it disappear you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah um it, it was funny and, th- and then the fact that she re- she recruited him you know made him disappear in a box and then let him do that for the rest of their shows that that was pretty good i mean you know <laughs> i thought that was an original idea so you know so she recruited spock to actually be in his show after, after she heckled her, after he heckled her. So anyway, um, so that was funny. Um, but I just, um, so yeah, I just thought it, it's entertaining. And if you, you know, if you, I guess if you like reading, I don't know, circus shows or something, you might find this entertaining. Um, well, and then one thing that I forgot, didn't mention to that, I, the other part that, you know, I, I overall I thought it was well written and like I said I like the first half which was all the introductory stuff I did feel like when it got to the point when they were on the world ship I just don't think the descriptions were very good I don't know if it was the editing that stuff got cut out or it was like put in the wrong place but a lot of it like it just I had trouble understanding what they were even talking about um, and it just seemed like you would read one paragraph to, to the next and like something was missing or part of the description. Like I didn't understand it as even a ship at first because they made it seem like it was a bunch of um, like a net in space almost. Um, and yeah, so, I, I do know what you mean. Yeah. And so then they're like talking about it. It's like a ship. And then they say they go over there, but they're outside and you're like, but wait outside what where's the plant like you know it, it i had it was just confusing to me so that and then there's like a scenes where um they go onto the ship but it's like going on to a planet um you know and spock is um we didn't really talk about it but he has to mind meld with the um you did mention he has to mind meld with one of these aliens so that they can learn how to communicate with um the enterprise crew because they don't you know, they speak through this singing language that humans can't understand and Spock can't understand. And doing the mind meld kind of makes Spock's brain overload because they're so more advanced. And so he goes down, I want to say he goes down to the planet, but it's not a planet. He goes, and there's like these, all these scenes where they're trying to go after him because he's kind of out of his mind. And, you know, I just, I didn't think that part was as well written. It was very confusing to me and I didn't really know what was going on so it was like up to a certain point i thought the book was great and then that section in the middle it was like yeah so yeah so i'd say like you know i'm gonna give it like a thumbs on the side okay (laughs) (laughs) no quatloos or uh you know i would like give it uh, out of five quatloos like two like i would say it was okay um part of it was good and part of it wasn't so good it wasn't it wasn't bad I just I just don't feel like it was one that I could really recommend yeah I would I would say three quad lose out of five because it was because it was entertaining and it it had some good things in it it was you know it was it was a fun read I thought it was a, a fast read and I liked the the science fiction elements and the fact that it brought the crew together in, in that way and it, introducing them and getting to know them the way they were back then. So that's me. So I guess that's it. And we will talk to everyone next time. All right. Nice talking to you and uh, really great to be back on the show and we'll look forward to 
next time, which when we are going to be talking about um, The Rift by Peter David. Thanks for listening. Make sure you hit that subscribe button and join our Facebook group. Live long and may the force be with you. Nanu, nanu.